In this lecture segment, we are talking about German artist Albrecht Dürer. We will focus on a self-portrait and two prints. Albrecht Dürer was the son of a goldsmith and grew up in Nuremberg, the city where the Nuremberg Chronicle was published by his uncle. So he is raised in a context steeped in printmaking and publishing and innovation in both of those contexts. To help you place this in time, you can see Leonardo's and Michelangelo's life and death dates. So he's part of the same generation as Michelangelo, and they make their professional entrances at about the same time. Nuremberg was a special place. It did not have a guild system, which gave Dürer greater freedom as an artist and fewer restrictions. It is one of the cities of the Holy Roman Emperor, and as a reminder, this is roughly the empire Charlemagne formed, and which is eventually called the Holy Roman Empire. So Dürer will benefit from court patronage. He trains as a goldsmith and printmaker and travels often, leaving Nuremberg whenever there is an outbreak of plague. He spends lots of time in Venice, Padua, Rome, and Florence, in addition to traveling all over Northern Europe. He buys a house in Nuremberg in 1509 and begins working for the Holy Roman Emperor Maximilian officially in 1512. From a young age, Dürer creates self-portraits at age 13, at age 26, noting his age and identity in each one. He is the first artist we know of who returned repeatedly to the self-portrait as a leitmotif of his career. In this portrait at the age of 28, we see Dürer cultivating an identity as a creator. It was a private portrait that he made just for himself and was in his collection at the time of his death. He shows himself as a creator in the guise of deity, like the Pantocrator we talked about in Byzantine art, like images of Roman emperors, with this frontal pose, the hair with a curl over the forehead, his gesture, creating an image of him as a divine royal creator. His clothing is very fine, wearing a fox fur collar and breaking sumptuary laws or rules about what folks from different classes could wear. We've already talked about a sumptuary law when we taught, discussed emperors and how wearing all purple was reserved just for them. Dürer breaks those rules here to show himself as he wanted to be treated. He was one of the artists at this time who had the opportunity to spend months in Italy and Northern Europe, and he noticed how differently artists in Italy were treated in comparison to how artists at home were treated. He said in a letter from Italy, here I am a gentleman, at home a parasite, referring to his place in the artisan class in Nuremberg, that even with all his accomplishments, he was still seen as less than, compared to the position of Michelangelo and Leonardo, who were treated like geniuses in Italy. He casts himself as a god, a creator, highlighting his right hand that he uses to create. This portrait was an expression for him of how he wanted to be seen as a creator instead of as a craftsman. This is an example of Renaissance self-fashioning, an image that presents a constructed identity that expresses specific characteristics of the sitter. It's a lot like seniors in high school having their senior portraits taken with the objects that they use in athletics or in theater or in music. So he sets out to use printmaking to elevate his status and the status of northern artists. And part of the way he does this is to merge printmaking with other genres like painting, sculpture, and architecture. He makes use of the portable nature of prints to gain international exposure for his work and to raise his social and artistic status. In 1515, he gets a commission from the Holy Roman Emperor Maximilian to make a triumphal arch out of woodcuts. He works with the team for three years to cut 195 woodblocks and produce a composite image that is huge, reviving the triumphal arch form we saw in the Roman Empire, creating a huge work of political propaganda for the emperor and a way for Dürer to elevate his medium, transforming ink and paper into architecture and sculpture, and with its reproducibility and portability, such a moment was not confined to one location, but could be sent to courts all over Europe to spread the message of Maximilian as a true Roman emperor far and wide, similar to how Charlemagne revived Roman models to underscore his rule. 
He also writes extensively about art and art making, as per theories of art making in the Renaissance, a work of art held greater status if it required intellectual exercise to produce it. Durer raises the intellectual foundation of his art and tries to elevate the discourse of the art of his fellow northern artists by presenting systems of mathematical perspective, canons of proportion for the human body, and treating art as if it is a window on the world. In a print he made at the start of the 16th century, Durer pulls together his international learning in a work of art that combines his northern training with his Italian learning. This engraving is about the size of a piece of paper and depicts Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden around the time of the fall of man. They are placed in a rich woodland setting. He signs the print prominently, engraving his signature in Latin in reverse into the plate, declaring his name, his hometown, and the year. Northern Renaissance characteristics of this work of art include the precise, minute details of the plants and animals, the emphasis on translating his observations of the natural world into ink on paper, like being able to feel the texture of the tree trunk. The work is loaded with intellectual and theological content. Each of the four animals represent a different humor or bodily fluid that becomes out of balance at the fall of man. We also see characteristics of Italian Renaissance art. These are not Northern European nudes. Remember that Northern artists did not have an existing tradition for showing the nude. If we compare Durer's Adam to Van Eyck's Adam, we see Durer model modeling his Adam on the Apollo Belvedere, a Roman copy of a Greek sculpture that he may have seen in Italy. He is not showing an everyday Adam like Van Eyck's with its stark naturalism. Durer's Eve is another take on Venus imagery that he would have been familiar with from his travels in Italy, versus Van Eyck's Eve that is a generalized female ideal that has little link to the anatomy of an actual female body. And he is depicting these figures according to an ideal canon of proportions, with ideal musculature and in contraposto. He has learned his Italian lessons and is definitely drawing on classical sculpture in his depictions of these figures, consciously not making nudes that look like his northern traditions. He is making sculpture in print. He's also engaging with painting in print. Look at how he's used chiaroscuro in print to model the flesh of the figures. He's using printmaking in a painterly way to capture the softness of flesh and to distinguish between the texture of a tree trunk snake skin, and human skin. In this final comparison in our coverage of Renaissance art, we see Durer's Adam and Eve and Michelangelo's David. They were made at the same time by two young artists who used their favorite medium to announce to the world what they were capable of as creators. Both cultivated identities as creators and magnified the potential of their preferred medium, creating objects and images that express the innovation that characterizes the Renaissance period.